Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm Kip Cherry. I'm a conservation chair for the Central Group. And I'd like to introduce Joanne Pannone, who is the chair of the Central Group. I'm happy for everybody to be here tonight. I uh, hope that people are paying attention to what's going on in their towns because Kip and I and the others here in uh, Sierra Club are getting a lot of calls about the warehouses that are going up. And Sierra Club is a volunteer organization. We've been around since 1892 and we've done a lot of um, saving open space and, and stopping uh, development, but it has to come from you. You have to go to your town meetings and you have to uh, get your legislators to do what you want them to do. Um, there's, um, with the elections coming up this, this uh, November, uh, there's a lot of jobs on the line. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, I guess that's all I have. Okay. Thanks, Joanne. So uh, before I introduce Elliot Ruga, I want to comment on forest stewardship. And I'm sure that Elliot will uh, continue to mention more things about this issue. Stewardship is a nice word. It means taking care of something but sometimes a good term can be used to mislead. That is the case with proposed legislation that requires a forest stewardship plan. The problem is that such plans require consultants to prepare and they have cost, which pushes those who are trying to maintain a forest to find a way to earn some money to pay for their plan. Hence the word, the ugly word, logging raises its head. And where you have logging, gone is the natural habitat and gone is the natural sequestration of greenhouse gases. So the focus right now is on four bills in the New Jersey Assembly, 848-43 to uh, A4846. Taken together, they require a forest stewardship plan for three acres and state-owned lands above 25 acres. They take out the requirement for municipal approval of forest, uh, forest stewardship plans which eliminates the public review. They make DEP's rules supersede municipal ordinance and they require prescribed burns. So those are all of the uh, problematic issues that are created by these bills. So the result is that the Sierra Club vigorously opposes this legislation. And we encourage everyone to take action to oppose these bills. As a follow-up to this lecture, we will provide a model letter for communicating with your legislator if you're interested in doing so. We'll also be sending out a copy of the video to everyone who RSVP. And now I want to tell you about Elia Ruga, Policy and Communications Director at the Highlands Coalition. Elliot has over 25 years of environmental and historic preservation advocacy experience. Uh, he has worked with the coalition since 2007. He does a variety of things, including leading media and educational campaigns, interacts with state legislators, regulators, and Highland Council staff, provides guidance to groups working to protect Highland's resources, and reaches out to municipalities uh, regarding municipal conformance. He has uh, also earned himself two Emmy Awards, and he has 17 years of experience that um, he um, received from NBC. So I'm very uh, pleased to int introduce Elliot tonight. Uh, Elliot, take it away. Thank you, Kip. I'm very happy to be here with my friends at the Central Jersey group of the, of the New Jersey chapter of the Sierra Club. Um, we share a lot of um, same feelings about the importance of the Highlands and before I talk about the bills that we are challenged with um, recently, I'd like to talk a little bit about, as soon as the ambulance passes in front of me, um, talk about the very incredible forest resources New Jersey is fortunate to have here in the Highlands. I'm talking about an area of New Jersey, which is bounded by uh, the town of Bruton in the south, um, to the west by Sparta and Hardiston, and in the north uh, corner of Vernon Township, 
and in the in the east, Mawa and Bloomingdale. And you know, we, we have to lay these um, names over the resource so people understand where we're talking about. But let's take a look at it without all those artificial jurisdictions. And if we look at an aerial view, we see this concentration of dense green. And what we're really looking at is a, con a nearly contiguous, contiguous intact forest with lots of bodies and water, uh, uh, lots of bodies of water. And this is the most intact forest we have in Northern New Jersey. Let's zoom out a little bit. We see to the east, we have highly developed land to the east and to the south. And to the west is the agricultural lands in the Kittatinny Valley before we um, go further west to the, to the Kittatinny Ridge which is outside of the highlands. And I know this was promoted earlier as um, 280 or 260 square miles, but uh, Emil DeVito made a good case that the Western border should be Route 15, which gave us some more miles. This we're really talking about a 360 square mile um, healthy, intact forest in the more northern, the more densely populated northern half of the most densely populated state. This is quite improbable, but we have it. And because of a variety of circumstances, this has not been developed and has remained largely forested. It actually, the critters don't uh, respect that boundary between New York and New Jersey. So if we go all the way into the Sterling Forest and through the Hudson Highlands, it's about 920 square miles of a nearly contiguous forest. And we can go even further, almost to um, the Canadian border, a 6,300 square mile forest, which is the Appalachians. And you know these were formed um, 2,500 million years ago when the supercontinent Pangaea rifted into separate continents that we know of today. And when these mountains were formed, they were about as high as the Himalayas. But after 2,500 million years of erosion, what we have left are the stumps of those mountains, the granite that is the highlands today. And why would we have bear in downtown Booton? That's Main Street Booton, because Booton is the southern extent of this forest. Around 1900, uh, Cornelius Bermule was a geologist working for New Jersey State Geologist. And he mapped all of the land in northern New Jersey that was forested in the year 1900. And he came up with this map. Now, 1870 marked the year that northern New Jersey didn't have a barely had a tree left standing because in the highlands all told between 1620 and 1969 there were 512 mines most of them iron mines and there were hundreds of iron furnaces and forges which were fueled by charcoal and each one of these furnaces and forges furnaces and forges would consume about two square miles per year of timber. 1870 was the year that these furnaces and forges converted to coal. And it was a good thing because there was almost no fuel left. And when they discovered that they could use anthracite in Pennsylvania shipped on the Morris Canal, 
that revitalized this industry and allowed New Jersey to reforest. So in 1900, this represented 30 years of forest growth. And what we're finding today is that land that was forested in 1900 and is still forested today was never converted to agriculture, was never cleared, and it's the oldest maturing forest we have in the state. And the soils of these forests that have never been disturbed, that have never been uh, turned over, tilled, or compacted, have a natural resistance to invasive species, which provides a very, very valuable service. We also have from 1930, a statewide aerial survey where we can also see land that was forested. So if it was in forest in 1900 and 1930 and today, we, these are maturing over 150 year old forests that are very healthy, that provide New Jersey with an incredibly efficient and abundant supply of water. They also have housed habitat to New Jersey's widest diversity of species. So many of them endangered and threatened. And could I remind everybody to please mute because we're hearing your household sounds which is our distraction. Thank you. So if we look at Vermeule's forest map and we outline the highlands, we see this wide, uh, it's about 16 miles wide, 16 miles deep forest. And we put some place names so we can understand where they are. So the resources this forest provides, again, uh, besides water, besides biodiversity, it also has incredible and abundant accessible outdoor recreation, which I'm sure many of you enjoy. And it is a incredibly it's a cost-free and, and efficient engine for carbon sequestration and is a significant part of New Jersey's climate resilience strategy. Now this is the Highlands Preservation Area, which is also um, a forest. When the Highlands legislation divided the Highlands into two distinct regions, the preservation area and the planning area, the preservation area was the core central forest. And it, they really just drew a line around a single forest. Up here in the north, it is the widest and the deepest. It is most buffered from human disturbance. As we head south, that forest breaks up into thinner fingers. So it doesn't, it doesn't have, and there's a lot of agriculture that occurred in the southern part of the highlands. It's only in this north where we have this most mature, wide, deep forest where we, where we have, we have a forest that just, all we, all we have to do is not mess with it and it will continue to provide these values for generations to come. But that's the challenge because as land values rise perpetually in Northern New Jersey or any place else in the state, the pressure to develop only increases. And what we've seen with 
the past administration in Trenton was very deliberate attempt to weaken the Highlands Act and to roll and to, and to weaken the regulations and to undermine the Highlands Council. So even though we have a Highlands Act, it, we have to be constantly vigilant against attempts to weaken it so that people can exploit these resources and extinguish them for good. So, but I'm sure I'm, pe I'm preaching to the choir. We're on the same side on this issue, but you understand that it's always a fight. And in a, a little bit later, I'll talk about the latest threat to this forest, which is a series of bills that were introduced in the legislature. So again, this is the, the deepest, this is the most, uh, the largest forest we have in the Highlands and in Northern New Jersey. And it's been protected, you know, it's been protected. We have it because the topography, the landscape is rugged. It's a series of ridges, which aren't particularly high, but they're steep and they run from the Northeast to the Southwest. So they were difficult to cross. Um, really the first transportation that allowed this area to develop was the Morris Canal, and it was south of this. So the north side of the Morris Canal remained undeveloped. And then when we found ways that we could develop in, on ridge tops and, um, and in sensitive areas where, um, you know, our machinery and development got more sophisticated, we had protected a lot of this land to buffer a reservoir systems. And when this was more recently threatened, the Highlands Act passed. So there are a series of natural occurrences and um, other um, defenses over time, which resulted in this being protected, but it is not fully protected. We still have to be careful. So I'm going to, when our experience of this forest is from roadsides or perhaps hiking, we really don't get to see the entirety of this resource so we can really understand it. So I'm gonna give you a different view from a single engine plane. And this is, when we look at it from this perspective, we could understand it better. This is mostly the um, Newark Reservoir properties, 35,000 acres in the Highlands. And we can see how unfragmented this is, how lush this is. Um, how clean the water is, and we can understand why we have such abundant wildlife here. And it's a really special place. But most people don't have this perspective on this resource. Another view, which was from just two weeks ago, here we go. What we're looking at is it's the Wallkill River Valley to the right. That's the western edge of the highlands. This is Hamburg and Sparta Mountain on the western side. This is largely protected land, state wildlife management area. And most people just don't think that we have a forest of this significance in New Jersey, so close to where all of us live. And if we look a little, we'll see some of the recent forest management cuts in this forest in a moment. As one's coming up on the right. This is one at least they left timber in place. That's a help. Great. Uh, and of course, we also have to say goodbye to your super bad partner. Martin, huh? you're not 
Um, Somebody's not on mute. There's Edison Bog, natural heritage priority site where there are globally and um, nationally imperiled plant species. And we do have these utility rights of way. There's another, there's another um, management, a clear cut. Why aren't these utility rights of way providing the early secessional habitat, which DEP says we need so badly? This is Beaver Lake. I don't know if many of you have ever been there. This is a lake community in the Highlands that they actually shut during the winter. Um, most of the lake communities in the highlands uh, have been insulated over the years. They're year-round communities. This is one which is very low impact. People leave during the winter. How, the homes are not heated. It's a very cool place. So another reason we don't see this forest as a single resource is because it is balkanized by so many different ownerships. There's municipal um, open, municipal owned land, county owned land, state parks and um, state forests, federally owned land, uh, nonprofit owned land, there's farmland, water supply management areas. There's so many different um, owners that we only think of it in, 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 you know, if we go to Northern Green State Park, we just think of Northern Green State Park. We don't necessarily see how it is part of this 360 square mile forest we have, which is the core forest of the Highlands. And the private land, which is about a third of this, only about Two thirds of the Highlands preservation area is protected, but about one third is in private ownership. And the Highlands Act has 17 exemptions. And most of these private lands could develop under a Highlands exemption. And that would, that, that could, if all those exemptions were executed, that could severely impair the health of this forest. And now we see that these state, municipal, and county-owned lands may have to, may be forced to employ forestry practices, which are really hurting our forests because they are logging centric. Logging centric. It's a, it's a style of forestry, school of forestry that always has to be, it's, it's, somebody's not muted. I really need to ask everybody. Can to, you mute everybody? Do I have that option? Uh, I think Kathy's iPad is unmuted. Maybe you could mute that one. Oh, I can mute this person. I can mute that person, but I don't know if that's every, well, that's certainly better. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Oh, so this is a style of forestry, which is allowed on private land. And, you know, in a way that's okay, that's private. I'd rather it be uh, um, undeveloped and a way that a landowner can keep it undeveloped is to be able to get um, farmland assessed and make some money um, doing some forestry so that they can afford to keep it in a somewhat natural state. But this is not appropriate for our state and uh, other public lands. And oddly enough, forestry like this is exempt from the Highlands Act, which again, makes sense for a private property owner, but why would we not have the highest standards for the lands we purchase with our tax dollars to preserve yes. them 
in their natural state. Yes. So another problem we have, I mean, this, this is a very cost effective way to do forestry, but it, you can see the impact, what it does, it, it disturbs soils. These soils now become um, vulnerable to invasive, uh, invasives, which they hadn't been before. They dragged heavy equipment, uh, created ruts in the roads, uh, heavy machinery going through wetlands. They destroy sensitive communities. They impact the soil. This is not what our forests need. The claim is that our forests are all single aged, even aged, and we have to diversify the age class of these forests. But when we've gone into these forests and counted tree rings, we find that's just not true. That there are trees 75 year, year old, there are trees 150 years old. These are diverse forests and they're maturing. We're also finding that maturing forests, older forests are more effective and efficient at, at absorbing carbon I know and this. young forests. So for our climate resiliency values, we should not be doing this. And we also found that if there is an ecological reason to go and do management, in order to pay for the management, it's always larger than is necessary for the ecological restoration they intend so they can afford to pay for it. We should leave these forests alone. They're doing quite well on their own. Um, you know, if you, on the roadsides of major roads, you'll see barberry, you'll see stilt grass, but if you wander in 50 yards, those invasives will disappear. These forests have the least deer problem. I mean, there's high amount of deer, but not like any place else. You don't even see a browse line. This also takes away, this management takes away from our recreational use. Um, you know, these areas are cordoned off. There's a trail that runs through it. Um, that trail is closed. It's a diversion of our public lands. We don't want to see this occur on our public lands. And one of the main reasons they claim they're doing this is to provide habitat for um, golden wing warbler. But a golden wing warbler may have, because of the warming climate, may have left New Jersey. Why? Why risk the habitat of interior forest species for a species that may, may no longer have the habitat it needs to survive here in these woods? So this is what's going on in Sparta Mountain. And this could be happening in most of our public lands in New Jersey, if we don't stop these series of bills that were introduced. So what's the alternative to this type of forestry? Yes, our forests do need some help, but these forests are the healthiest in New Jersey. Why are you doing this management at the, at the forests which need the least amount of, of help? Also, when you do a clear cut like that, you're, you're creating new edge ha habitat. Who loves edge habitat but deer? You yeah. attract deer to come here. Just doesn't make any sense. So the New Jersey Highlands Coalition's um, Natural Heritage Committee has come up with a series of policy recommendations for forest stewardship uh, for New Jersey's public lands. And it's available on our website at njhighlandscoalition.org. And this is written by forest ecologists, um, um, people with advanced forestry de degrees, 
this is not uh, a feel good um, <coughs> tree hugging treatise. This is serious science that this is based on. And we would like to see our Department of Environmental Prote uh, Protection and Division of Fish and Wildlife to adopt this because what our forest needs is deer management, invasive species management. They do not need to be creating early secessional habitat. And the term we like to use is proforestation, a new, a fairly new term um, coined by William Mumar. And he says, the most effective thing that we can do is to allow trees that are already planted, that are already growing, to continue growing to reach their full ecological potential, to store carbon and develop a forest that has a full complement of environmental services. This is true ecological restoration, proforestation. Let our forests, our maturing forests, become someday again old growth forests. And you cannot do that by cutting them down. So the bills that are, have been introduced in the legislature, um, these three are the most egregious. Um, and they now have Senate companions and there will be a hearing, the Senate Environment Committee on April 21st on these bills, plus a forest stewardship bill, which defines forest stewardship sponsored by Senator Smith. So the, um, these began in the assembly, so I'm referring to them by their assembly numbers. A4843 will require forest stewardship plans for all lands owned by a municipality or a county where they own 25 acres or more. And that would be a significant amount of forest in New Jersey. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with forest stewardship. It's the logging centric forestry that's being practiced. And the requirement for a forest stewardship plan under this legislation is that it be written by a state approved forester. And that's the problem. A forester could have a inclination to do ecologically based forestry, but that's not what they've been traditionally practicing. State approved foresters generally like to cut wood, log. They like to, they look at their training of, to look at a forest is for its timber value, timber production. Looking at a forest as a farm, as a tree farm. And that's not what our forests are about. There is a balance of ecological services, a very um, fragile interrelationship between the soils, the trees, the amphibian species, the mammals, the birds, the soils, the water, that all have ecological significance. And they're all important, not just a straight, narrow, uh, good looking tree that can be cut down and sold to a lumber mill. So A4843 will require a forest stewardship plan for every publicly owned forest that was purchased with Green Acres funding of 25 acres or more. Currently, there is no funding that, that comes along with these bills. So, I mean, that alone qualifies as an unfunded mandate, which is prohibited by the New Jersey Constitution. Um, however, if a municipality or a county wanted to recoup the cost of the 
required forest stewardship plan, they could extract some timber from their forest and that will pay for it. Or worse, if they, like most municipalities in New Jersey are under financial stress, they can find that they now have a revenue stream by extracting timber from their forests, their public owned forests that we paid with our tax dollars and get some revenue. So A4844 A will actually prohibit that a municipality can require municipal approval. And this, 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 um, this applies to even private land. So if, if a municipality had tree ordinances that tried to manage how forestry was practiced within their mu municipality, they no longer can do so. And A4845 will require that a statewide goal is established of conducting prescribed burns for a minimum of 50,000 acres annually in the Pinelands and an additional 10,000 acres elsewhere in the state. Now, the Pinelands, the Pinelands succession of forest, natural succession depends on fire in order for some of their trees to regenerate. That's not the case in the highlands. Limited for, uh, burning is very effective on s very small parcels to get a handle on invasive species, but there is no reason to require an additional 10,000 acres of prescribed burn elsewhere in the state. Is our, our the people who do this just not getting enough work we need to require that they're employed. It's, it's an arbitrary number and it's just, there, there's no basis for this. And the Pinelands Commission should be responsible and, they, and they're the ones who have the final say on prescribed burns and forestry in the Pinelands. They're the experts, let them say. There's no reason we should be preempting their authority that these bills would require. So um, there will be one thing that has uh, a, a very recent uh, positive development is that the League of Municipalities is going to be asking um, their municip municipalities to pass resolutions opposing these bills, which is a very positive uh, thing for us. We've been working very hard with um, some other players. Um, Ken Dulski's in the audience here today. He's been probably working 80 hours a week on um, communicating with municipalities, with mayors, with counties to get these um, so that people understand what's at risk and providing means to take action. So the question is, can these bills be amended or they, should they just go away? We believe the bills can be amended, but it's too, it's, it's the bill, it would be impractical to require, the proper forestry is the right thing to do and we have recommendations to the legislature for doing it, but it's expensive. We're not sure how it, it could be paid for. This forestry could be free, but it will destroy our forests. So I am open to your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, very well done. Um, it raised a lot of issues and it seems to me that uh, one of the key issues is uh, educating our legislators about what forests really are, what they contribute, uh, being that their natural habitat, which is a huge uh, a plus for the state 
and also uh, the sequestration of um, greenhouse gases. So these, uh, the forests are doing us a service and, and, and that service is owned by the public. Uh, you could also argue that um, when the public bought Green Acres uh, properties, that they bought the forests, that that was part of the sale price. So essentially we are now selling something that we purchased previously without public permission really. And it seems to me that that should be rethought. Back in the American Revolution, if you look at uh, many assets of, uh, of uh, people when they died, the wooded uh, properties were listed as an asset because everyone needed uh, uh, woods for burning and you know, to stay uh, warm. And so that was considered an asset to buy a wooded lot and you paid for those trees. It wasn't, they were not free. I'm just throwing that out there. Anyway, um, let's go uh, through these uh, questions in the chat. Um, what companies are going to benefit from logging? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, you know, um, so. <laughs> I, I, I don't think anybody is making a windfall on logging. I mean, we're not doing plantation uh, scale logging, but there is a financial uh, motive. Um, the, I think it's full employment for forestry professionals. Um, I think it's full employment for logging companies. Um, okay. Um, but so, I, I, would so assume, I would assume that these logging companies have lobbied their legislators that this idea just didn't come out of the blue. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure um, that, you know, there is a, a nationwide movement or initiative called the Young Forest Initiative. And it's, and it, um, it is promoting this type of forestry across the nation. It's very sophisticated um, and people have bought it, including many of our legislators, and it's up to us to educate them properly. Okay, we have um, a question uh, regarding uh, controlled burns. And of course, we've heard in the Pine Barrens that uh, controlled burns are useful. Uh, what do you, how do you comment on that issue? Well, I mean, I, I can't speak about the, the Pinelands where, um, you know, they have an entirely different ecology um, than um, the forests in the north. I mean, they, you know, they, they have massive wildfires or potential for massive wildfires. I mean, they, they have a duff layer that's very dry and, you know, can result in massive wildfires. We don't, we have a much moister, uh, wetter forest here in the north. I mean, I can't remember the last devastating wildfire in the highlands. I mean, they, they ha happen uh, every once in a while in the pinelands. Uh, prescribed ver burns on a very limited basis, a small area, maybe a few acres, for a, not certainly not in the highlands core forest, but in a post-agricultural forest where they're really having a problem with deer and uh, invasive species. Uh, such as maybe in Eastern Mars County, no. Lewis Mars no. County Park, no. Jockey Hollow. I mean, there's nothing growing underneath no. but invasive species. No. On a limited basis, a prescribed burn uh, could be effective, but there's no reason no. to require 10,000 acres of ye a year outside of the outside of the pinelands. All right, that seems like a lot. There's a comment here that the New Jersey Audubon is pushing uh these bills do you know anything about that um i know that new jersey audubon supports these bills um you know yes i um uh, you know i do I, I work with audubon in other areas for for restoration projects where they do a very good job. Um, I don't think they're the evil empire. Um, we disagree with them stridently and they disagree with us 
stridently. Um, and we're, we, what can I say? Oh, it mentions here, Elliot, that um, New Jersey Audubon um, has uh, some foresters who uh, participate in writing the plans. So they might consider this a source of revenue to them. I don't know. Um, yes, they do write forest stewardship plans and it, and it probably is a source of revenue for them as well. Okay, well, that's, you know, it I mean, they, they, though, could write, they could write ecologically based plans as well. Yeah, that's right. I think some education maybe of the Audubon Society might be useful too. We should have yes. a little more discussion with them. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, the Young Forestry Policy uh, was just featured in a magazine. Oh, and I guess in the Audubon magazine. It's just a comment. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, uh, oh, I had a, uh, there was a question regarding the flyway, uh, migratory bird flyway. Do you know uh, where the flyway is in, in terms, does it go along the Delaware River? Is this, is this part of the flyway, do you know? Um, you mean the highlands? I mean, there's yes. some there's yeah. very, very um, um, iconic uh, bird watching locations in the highlands, um, such as Hawk Watch, but um, I don't know, you probably have to ask Audubon what's the best bird watching sites in the, in the state. The River, yeah. Right, we, we have, um, I've asked Cornell University to do some research on that because we have a, a site uh, that's proposed for development that has 197 bird species on it, which suggests that it's uh, a breeding site and uh, it has a, a high level of, of bird activity on it. And so we're trying to, I'm trying to find out and, and define exactly where the flyway is. Uh, here's a question. Uh, what can a private citizen do? Uh, write to a legislator or is there some other? Find out, who, uh, write to your legislator because call them, write them a letter, do both, uh, try to speak with them. Um, they're your legislators um, and educate them why they should vote against these bills. Absolutely. Do that tomorrow. These bills are active in the legislature today. They're having budget hearings right now. Yes, but there will be a Senate environment hearing um, April 21st on these bills. And um, that means these are moving forward. Wow. So um, for the hearing, can you participate in a Zoom uh, activity? Is, that if you go to the New Jersey Legislature website, um, there is find on the left column, um, there is, well, go to the calendar and um, there's a calendar right in the center and click on April 21st. They will show you uh, which, which committees are, uh, are meeting that day click on Senate environment, because it is meeting that day, or go to, uh, there's a side column where you can click on Senate committees, click on Senate environment, uh, click on their schedule. And if you go to April 21st, they will show you uh, the bills that are being heard, which are these series. And there's a registration button there where you can register to participate um, in their virtual committee hearing. And they will explain to you how to do it and um, how to testify. And we, I don't know, you know, if they're, if they'll take 500 testimony, probably not knowing Mr. Smith, uh, Senator Smith, but you should try. And if you don't, you should write your legislator and tell them that you oppose these bills by their number and why. And you, uh, you can uh, participate as an individual as well as representing an organization. Sometimes yes. they'll only allow um, an organization to be represented by one person, but you can still represent yourself as a uh, voter and as a uh, local citizen. So sometimes that's more powerful really than anything else. Yeah. So it's an NJLEG, right? N uh, NJLEG, NJ that's correct, .org, NJLEG. 
dot org. Okay, um, and, and there's uh, there's also uh, I'm sorry, Kip. There's yeah. also a way you can identify who your legislators are uh, by your municipality on that front page, um, and they'll list their phone numbers, who they are, and their phone numbers, and e email addresses. Right, and there's a comment in the chat that uh, in this in the 26th district, it's futile. But I've actually seen legislators uh, and other council people change their opinion right in front of the public uh, from one day to another because overnight or over the a few, couple of days they got hit by a lot of people right. that objected to their point of view. That's right. That's right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be fatalistic about this. They need to hear from you. Right. Uh, and also, I've been asked to differentiate between National Audubon and uh, New Jersey Audubon. Yeah. So I, I just want to do that. Uh, Na New Jersey Audubon says yeah. that they're older than National um, Audubon, actually. Yeah. Oh. So what? <laughs> Here's a comment that the promoters of these bills are very organized. And uh, this person provides a uh, Farm Bureau is one, New Jersey Foresters is another. That's, that's uh, correct. Oh my. And I'm sure that's true, but um, again, citizens by themselves have a lot of, uh, of influence. It's a matter of speaking out. And um, if enough people speak out, it does make a huge difference. And it doesn't take that many people really to change the situation. Uh, that, here's a person asking for the sample letter. Yes, uh, we will send it out to everybody who RSVP'd. So you'll get that in the uh, email probably tonight. Um, Let's see what else. Um, something from uh, on Judy Dench that went by so fast I, I didn't quite get uh, it. <laughs> uh, can, can, yes. can you hear me? It's my passion for trees. She has a YouTube and it's oh. almost it's it's everything you want to know about a tree, but it's not, it's her passion for trees. It's a very enjoyable. You mean Dame Judy Dench? Yes, yes. Dame Judith Dench. Yep. Huh. She has a seven acre property and she goes around uh, with the other um, experts and they showed her a tree that was over 5,000 years old. It's, it's I, very I, enjoyable. I, All I, in England. Uh, that okay. reminds me, that reminds me on April 29th, New Jersey Highlands Coalition is um, hosting a webinar with Joan Maloof of the Old Growth, the National Old Growth Forest Network. And um, um, you can register for that on our website or going to Eventbrite. She's a very, very engaging, knowledgeable speaker about um, far, true f ecological forest stewardship. And uh, I'm sure it will be rather interesting um, discussion. There's so much to learn about our forests. They have their own natural uh, predators. We went through the gypsy moth. We go through the pine beetle. Uh, oak trees are suffering from viruses right now. Uh, and then the human being. Well, we should not be cutting down our forests. We should be no. dealing with these pathogens. That's why right. our forests need help with that. Right, a 200 year old tree you're not gonna replace in your lifetime. Can I make a comment? Yes. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ken Dalsky. And so uh, there's a couple of thoughts that I think we need to keep in mind. Um, at one level, you know, we certainly need to defeat these bills. Uh, it actually should, sh I mean, it's feasible to defeat them. Um, in addition to all the problems with logging, they are egregious overreaches of uh, local autonomy with unfunded mandates and taking away, you know, the power of the towns to manage their own property. Um, but be that as it may, you know, that's not necessarily going to fix this problem. Uh, they could come back in other forms. Um, the industry is still out there working as hard as they can to push a story that literally tells people that logging is good for forests. They even say logging will, uh, you know, increase sequestration um, and things like that, that I think a lot of people have bought into. And um, I think a lot of the legislatures, members of the legislature, I bought into and DEP 
whether they actually believe it or not, has bought into it because DEP has taken all that and used it in their uh, 2020 forest plan. At, the, at a higher level, we need to think about how we go about changing the paradigm here. Because right now, the one thing that I think should be paramount in any decisions to log is carbon sequestration, but it's not. You know, nowhere is it written in any of the forest management laws that you, know, you have to prioritize carbon sequestration. There, there's other things like sustainability and biodiversity, and the definitions of those can be you know, really loose and can easily be manipulated to support logging. Um, so we really need to focus now because of where we are with climate change on maximizing carbon sequestration. Now, and even that is subject to manipulation uh, because you know, the industry will talk about you know, uh, thinning trees and, you know, and, and, and burns in order to make catastrophic burns less, less likely. You know, but we're not California, at least not you know, in Northern New Jersey. And so, as Elliot said, we don't have the risk of catastrophic burns, and yet uh, the DEP keeps talking about catastrophic releases of carbon. So, uh, you know, we, we need, and it's going to be a tremendous battle to change the ground rules, to change the paradigm, to make carbon sequestration the absolute priority in, in forest management, which hopefully will lead to a lot of proforestation. You know, as well as, you know, um, replacing and fixing, you know, existing areas and planting new trees. Um, but, uh, you know, that I think is something we need to, we need to focus on. It's, you know, not just wringing our hands over what do we do in the short term. We need to make it financial, uh, we need a financial incentive for, uh, for retaining carbon. We need a, a system of carbon credit, which would help us out statewide to preserve our forests and also um, result in less um, of these types of forest management on private land. Well, thank you. I, I certainly agree. And um, I think that we're losing focus uh, often on climate change and keep uh, focusing on the small issue right in front of us. And it's the big issue that we really need to stay focused on. And um, the state has come up with greenhouse gas goals and then to uh, be supporting uh, cutting down forests is counterintuitive to what they uh, say they're trying to do. And again, it seems to be a lack of information from the public. Uh, another thing related, related to this is that um, when you put a logging trail through a forest, you are creating new edges. And birds right. don't breed on edges because uh, they, are, um, uh, they submit to uh, predators on the edges and they don't feel safe, so they don't breed. And so uh, gradually our birds are disappearing, uh, not just because they're killed by various things, but because they are not breeding the way they used to, because they no longer have safe habitat for breeding. And uh, so that's another thing that legislators don't understand and something uh, that they need to hear about. Uh, it's quite easy to talk to a legislator. They've got district offices. You don't have to go all the way to Trenton. And right now they're still doing Zoom. So if you want to have a meeting with a legislator, you just call up and say you'd like to have a meeting. You might get staff instead, but nevertheless, you get somebody and have a Zoom. And if you have uh, several people on the Zoom and are representing an organization, you might uh, get to the legislator. And they're, they're people. And the problem is they just don't hear from all of us regular people a lot of times. So those with experience in being in forests, that's compelling. Whether you're a bird watcher or a walker or whatever you might be, collector of, uh, of fruits in, in the forest, whatever it might be, they need to hear from you. So I just wanted to put in a plug for that. And don't, don't, don't think that um, lumber isn't expensive. Go to Home Depot and a two by four is $8 now. So we have local sawmills right here in Allentown outside of Trenton, and he's busy as could be. But he takes lumber from people that do tree jobs in people's yards. He's, you know, that's that's not the logging issue. So those those logging uh, trucks are hauling and making money. Um, and here's a comment: uh, logging also compacts the soil. So uh, having those heavy trucks in there, um, and again, uh, the logging roads are very devastating to a forest. Um, 
Here's a comment. Uh, let's see, when will legislators um, finally start um, understanding uh, what's happening to the planet and, uh, and to human from human action? And again, I, I think that's a matter of communication. And you shouldn't feel bad if you end up speaking to um, an aide, um, especially if it's a policy, if it's a policy aide. Sometimes they have a lot more on the ball than the legislator and um, the legislators rely on their good aides. So don't feel that you got cheated. You, you got cheated if you end up having an audience with an aide. Sometimes it's preferable. It's true. Um, okay, so um, if I've missed everybody, any questions, go ahead. Everybody sees Ken's announcement to sign up for his Forest Watch Earth Day with 350.org? It's in the chat. Okay. Does Thank that, you. Yes, that's uh, Sylvia okay. and I are presenting, and we're going to get into a lot of the politics um, issues and, you know, how we can work our way around those things, as well right. as, you know, talking about the bills but a little different angle on this. I, I wanna say something about the work that Ken's doing. I mean, uh, forestry is, is some, something we are um, fighting, the New Jersey Highlands Coalition, but we're fighting so many battles right now, bad development, um, all sorts of stuff, um, getting uh, the right people um, um, nominated or appointed to the Highlands Council. Ken is focusing on uh, on Ken and New Jersey Forest Watch are doing an incredible job, really uh, turning the table on these um, on on these bills. And um, you know, they we should cooperate with them as much as we can because I don't think anybody is working harder in this state. Uh, Food and Water Watch loaned us uh, about five or six interns. So we've sent out, you know, hundreds and hundreds of letters with, with nice. that help. That's great. Uh, here's a person who um, has a preserved farmland uh, with a forest stewardship uh, plan. And uh, she says she had to hire a state approved forester to write the plan. That's, um, that's true. Um, if you want to get, if you want to get the um, um, agricultural assessment um, for uh, a forested, property um it requires a state approved forester to write that plan and it costs you seven several hundred dollars but you can tell that forester i mean it's your property that you want to do ecologically based forestry and that you do not want to log logging right. is not a requirement right there's no dollar sign to it you don't have to make a profit on your law lo by logging to get your farmland assessed. Right. 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 You have to sell something. No, you don't. No, not any longer. You do not have to make a profit any longer. Really? Well, I mean, we understand the fact that people feel pushed when they have to spend quite a bit of money on a, a plan that they need to make up that money someplace because they may not be able to afford it or they might be a trust, nonprofit, they don't have any uh, financial wherewithal. So that's so the concern that we have is that these bills are pushing people in a direction that they shouldn't be pushed in. Correct, correct. There is a um, organization that certifies ecologically based foresters. Um, Zach, my colleague is here. He or Ken or Sylvia who's here can put that organization in the chat that's the type of professional um, you need uh, if you want to do an ecologically based forestry plan. And, and your, your plan is for 10 years. It's not for one year. Correct. Yes, it's a plan. Here, here's a person who commented that um, loggers get tax breaks for real estate and holding before they sell to commercial interests. And that this happened with a place called Waterview uh, in Persephone. Say that again. Uh, that uh, that the loggers got tax breaks for real estate that they were holding before they sold the uh, the property to commercial interest. Well, if they if they had a um, 
a forest stewardship plan, they would have gotten a tax right. credit. Well, it's complex, but um, I think that we all need to keep their, uh, our eye on the ball and we need to uh, make sure that our legislators understand that uh, we have a different point of view uh, and that our point of view should prevail. And at the very least, that hopefully will just uh, moot these bills and they won't go any further. But right now, with the hearing, uh, we need to present ourselves for the hearing. And uh, I think uh, even shade tree commissions, for instance, which are more urban oriented, uh, need to be involved in this because they in, individually as members know something about trees. And uh, so they need to express themselves as well. So if you have a shade tree commission in your community, you should talk to them or an environmental commission. Uh, so, you know, the, the more the merrier basically, but the 21st is coming up very quickly. So yes. if you are interested in providing testimony, you don't necessarily have to appear. You can submit written testimony and not, and not appear. So you don't have to feel intimidated by that. And Kip, you can register uh, your opposition to these bills without testifying and without submitting uh, written, written testimony either. I mean, it's ideal to back it up with written testimony, but you can register your opposition to these bills in your name and that, that gets part of the record. Right. We just check the box that says no need to testify. Right. And, the and uh, wait, when we're back, when 10. we're back in place, uh, that's the way it is too. When you uh, go to a hearing, you can um, just sign a, a piece of paper at the beginning of the hearing and say you don't need to appear, but your position is known because you put it on the slip of paper. Correct. So that's a normal procedure. Well, thank you very much. I think we've all learned a lot by this, and um, I think we're motivated to stay focused and. Um, so uh, thank you, Elliot. I really appreciate your, we all appreciate your, your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for coming. And you'll get a little email uh, from me with the uh, model letter, which will give you not only um, material to use for a letter or an email, but also if you want to submit a testimony, there might be something there that you can, that will help you get something started. So thank you very much. Good night all.